Good morning, everyone. Welcome to week seven of Current Topics in Genome Analysis. This week, we're honored to have with us Dr. Lynn Jordy from the University of Utah School of Medicine, where he serves as the HA and Edna Benning Presidential Endowed Professor and also the Chair of the Department of Human Genetics. Dr. Jordy received both his BA and PhD from the University of New Mexico. His lab has been involved in the studies of human genetic variation, mobile element evolution, and the genetic basis of human limb malformations. As well as the genetic diseases, as well as the genetics of common diseases such as hypertensional, hypertension and inflammatory bowel disease. He served on several advisory panels for the NSF as well as the NIH, and has also been an expert witness in a number of court cases involving DNA evidence. Finally, Dr. Jordy has received 12 teaching awards from the University of Utah, as, one, as well as one from the American Society of Human Genetics. I'm pleased that he'll be bringing his excellence teaching style here to NIH this morning, and I'm sure you'll enjoy and learn a lot from this morning's talk, which is intended to provide you with an overview of the field of population genetics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jordy to NIH this morning. Well, thanks very much, Tira. It's a pleasure to be here again uh, with you this morning. Uh, one thing I like to do in my pr presentations is to uh, allow questions during the presentation. I think it helps to break things up a little bit. So uh, uh, if you have a question as we're going along, uh, don't hesitate to ask. And I have to uh, disclose that I have no relevant financial relationships uh, with the content of today's lecture. So what I will talk with you about this morning, uh, we'll start with uh, a discussion of patterns of human genetic variation. We'll talk about variation among populations, as well as variation among individuals. Um, we'll talk about some applications of those studies. Uh, one is, I think, to enhance our understanding, to illuminate our understanding of a very controversial topic, that of race, uh, and what the biomedical implications of our enhanced understanding uh, are. Uh, finally, we'll talk uh, toward the end about linkage disequilibrium, the HapMap project, and now the 1000 Genomes project. How, how does the new sequence data, in particular, uh, illuminate our understanding of human genetic variation uh, and uh, biomedical applications? So that, that's what we'll be going over. Uh, and I think I, I, I would like to uh, stress that there are several areas in which Human genetic variation can be applied. First of all, we use it to decipher human history. We'll talk a little bit about that. We can infer individual ancestry. I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, we use it in forensic applications. We won't really talk about that today, but uh, more than 25,000 criminal cases each year uh, in the United States now involve forensic evidence. So it's routinely applied in that context. And finally, uh, and I think here at NIH, this is uh, perhaps the most important application, uh, finding and understanding uh, disease-causing genes. And we'll talk about how our studies of population genetics uh, help us to do that. So of course, the, the uh, fundamental source of human genetic variation is the process of mutation. Uh, we estimate the human mutation rate to be somewhere between one and two and a half times 10 to the minus 8, or 1 in 100 million, per base pair per generation. So what that translates to is that we, each of us, every time we reproduce, transmit somewhere between 30 and perhaps as many as 75 new variants with, with each gamete. Now the uh, upper estimate, two and a half, comes from phylogenetic comparisons of human variation with variation in the chimp. Uh, more recently, we've been able to estimate directly the human mutation rate by simply comparing DNA sequence in parents and offspring. Uh, and in a paper that we were involved in uh, a couple of years ago, uh, that's the uh, Roach paper, uh, we estimated the human mutation rate directly uh, to be about 1.1 times 10 to the minus 8, so on the lower end. Uh, and when the 1,000 genomes estimate came out a little bit later in Nature Genetics, uh, it was exactly the same as ours. So we have multiple estimates now based on uh, direct evaluation of sequence in families uh, that suggest the mutation rate uh, is somewhat lower than the previously estimated phylogenetic rate. Now here's a quote from Lewis Thomas that I especially uh, appreciate. 
the capacity to blunder slightly is the real marvel of DNA. Without this special attribute, we would still be anaerobic bacteria and there would be no music. So I think we should appreciate our mutations because it's from those mutations uh, that the genetic diversity that we see among us is derived. But of course, occasionally those mutations also cause disease. But understanding the processes that give rise to variation naturally is going to help us to understand uh, the basis of genetic disease. So given that mutations are being transmitted in every generation, the natural question to ask is, well, how much do we actually differ? So if we look at sequence difference in terms of aligned DNA base differences, of course, identical twins for all intents and purposes differ at none of their base pairs. That's not completely true, but close enough. For unrelated humans, uh, we differ at about one in a thousand base pairs. And of course, I think this is, a, this is an important, this is a very important statistic. The fact that we are 99.9% uh, .9 genetically identical at the level of DNA, the most fundamental unit of our biology, uh, I think says some very important things about us. Now, if we compare ourselves uh, to our nearest relative, the chimp, uh, we, uh, we differ at about one in a hundred base pairs. In other words, we are at the DNA level about 99% chimp. Uh, for aligned uh, base differences. It's several times more than that if we, uh, if we include uh, copy number variation. If we compare ourselves to the mouse, where there's about a 70 million year divergence, uh, we're substantially more different. And thankfully, uh, if we compare ourselves to broccoli, we are mostly different from broccoli uh, at the DNA level. So even though we are very similar, uh, at the DNA level, 99.9%, .9%, that still means that given our 3 billion DNA base pairs, there will be about 3 million differences, single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, between any pair of haploid human DNA sequences. Uh, so there's still a substantial reservoir of diversity uh, in human populations, and it's that diversity that we're especially interested in. Now, uh, if we look at copy number variants, uh, we see that uh, they, and we're defining them here as uh, variants greater than 1,000 base pairs or so, uh, they do account for about as much variation as do SNPs. And so by copy number variants, we simply mean that we have extra copies of chunks of DNA or missing copies of chunks of DNA, uh, and generally 500 or 1,000 bases or larger in size. And what we've found in the last couple of years is that each human is heterozygous for at least 100 of these copy number variants. And that accounts for about another 3 million bases of variation. So about the same amount of variation as is accounted for by SNPs. Uh, just much larger chunks of DNA, smaller numbers, but affecting about the same amount of actual overall DNA. So another important uh, source of genetic variation. So one of the questions that we can ask is, well, how much do populations differ? We've seen uh, how much individuals differ, but if we look at populations, how do they vary genetically from one another? So I'm going to show you um, data from a large series of populations. Uh, for some reason, the ah, it's showing up there. You can see uh, uh, the major continents. This is a series of populations uh, that uh, we've collected over time representing quite a, quite a diversity of human genetic variation. So how do we do this? Well, one, one way that we look at genetic variation in populations is by tabulating the frequencies of SNPs uh, in populations. So here we're showing three human populations. These could be continental populations, say Africa, Asia, Europe. Uh, and we're looking at allele frequencies for the major alleles of three SNPs. Uh, we see that uh, there is variation in the frequencies of these SNPs from one population to another. And then what we want to do is to assess that variation. This is one way that we do it. This is a statistic uh, that's used widely in population genetics called FST, 
And by the way, uh, I think I'm going to only show you two equations today, uh, and they will involve nothing more complicated than addition, multiplication, subtraction, and division. So uh, uh, it, I, I think it will be quite non-intimidating. Uh, but FST, uh, it, it, we can think of it easily as the difference between the total heterozygosity or total variation in our sample minus uh, the average variation within each population. So if you've got several populations, what we're asking is, is there more variation overall, if we look at the entire sample, than the average within each population. So HS is the average heterozygosity within each population, say within each continent. Uh, so you can see that if there is just as much variation within populations as the total, then FST will be zero. This will be equal to this, FST will be zero. And what that says is that all of the variation occurs within populations. There's no variation between populations. They don't really differ from one another. On the other hand, uh, if FST is at the other extreme, one, then that says that all variation exists between populations, and there's no variation within populations. So that's a, a measure of the extent to which population differences contribute to overall genetic diversity. And if we look at FST uh, for human populations, and these are a number of different kinds of systems, uh, different kinds of loci that have been assessed, short tandem repeats, uh, ALU insertion polymorphisms, L1 insertions, uh, a 250K SNP chip uh, in the populations I showed you, what we see is that very consistently for all of these different kinds of loci, Roughly 90% of variation is found between individuals within the major continents. Uh, and only about an extra 10% or so is seen uh, between continents. So one way to think about this is that if we assessed the diversity in Europe, we would have 90% of the diversity in the entire world. We only get another 10% by looking at the rest of the world because there isn't that much difference between populations. Most of the variation occurs between individuals within populations. Uh, and we see this very consistently for various kinds of genetic systems. Now we can compare that with FST for an observable trait, a phenotype, skin color. Uh, we can estimate FST for skin color in different continents and there we see that 90% of the variation occurs between continents because there is substantial difference between continents in terms of this trait, skin color. It's been highly selected uh, in human populations in different climates and latitudes. So we see substantial difference among populations for this observable trait. So it's kind of interesting to, to look at the contrast uh, between variation for this observable trait and variation for actual uh, genes and to see that it's much less uh, for large series of genes, large series of DNA sequence variation. So what that implies is that most variation that we see is likely to be shared among populations. And here's a tabulation uh, based on the 250K chip results uh, looking at four population groups, Africa, Europe, East Asia, and India. And what we find is that the minor allele of each SNP is present 79% of the time in all four groups. In other words, nearly 80% of the time, a given SNP allele is shared among all four groups. 88% of the time in at least three groups, 92% of the time in at least two groups. Uh, about 7% we see just in Africa, so there are some polymorphisms, some SNPs, uh, where we see the allele only in Africa. Only a tiny proportion is found only outside Africa, so more unique variation in Africa than outside of Africa, and we'll get back to reasons for that in just a moment. Uh, in that analysis, no SNPs were fixed present in one population, fixed absent in another. And so what that means is that there was no SNP out of those 250,000, not even a single one, that you could look at and say, well, if you have this variant, you must be 
from this continent, you can't be from that continent. And what that's telling us, again, is that most of these variants, the vast majority are shared uh, among multiple populations. Part of the reason for that is that they're relatively uh, common SNPs. And the, the uh, more common they are, the higher their frequency, they tend to be older in populations, therefore more likely to be shared. This is just a diagrammatic uh, representation of the same idea, showing that for the most part, we see overlap among these continental populations uh, for uh, SNP alleles. But now what if we look at sequence variation? What if we look at uh, less common SNPs? So here we see uh, common SNPs uh, that had been identified uh, in dbSNP. We see the, the um, overlap again, now millions of variants, uh, more that are unique to Africa, than our, and that's why our eye is an African population from uh, HapMap. Uh, this is an Asian sample. This is a European-derived sample. But you can see that most of the variants are shared. But if we look at new, rarer SNPs, lower frequency SNPs, most of them are not. And this makes sense. If a variant arose just in the last few thousand years, it's likely to be less common. It doesn't have as much time to attain a higher frequency. It's also more likely to be population specific. So for rare SNPs, we see much, much less sharing, a lot more difference between populations uh, as we would expect. For these common SNPs, the average allele frequency difference between populations is roughly 15%. Uh, but for the rare frequency alleles, less than 5%, uh, because these are very low frequency variants, they can't differ in frequency that much from one population to another. They're usually population specific, usually low frequency. So in fact, they don't affect the overall FST value very much. Even though there are many of them, they're so low in frequency uh, that they account for a relatively small proportion of overall genetic diversity. But we think it's an interesting part of that diversity uh, and to the extent that rare alleles contribute to disease and common disease, uh, that suggests that there should be some substantial population differences in terms of those alleles uh, and their risk effects. So how do we actually quantify uh, these genetic differences? Well, I'll show you just a simple uh, genetic distance measure. And again, this is very, very uh, simple mathematics. Uh, we're estimating a distance statistic, D, and it's simply the difference in frequencies of alleles in two populations that we la label I and J. So if we go back to our little table that I showed you earlier of SNP frequencies uh, in populations 1, 2, and 3, we can estimate a distance between populations 1 and 2 as the difference between these two SNPs. So just a very simple subtraction. And then we would average that over all of our SNPs. So this pair, this pair, this pair. Take the average, and we have an estimate of the genetic distance between the two populations. If we have a million SNPs, we would just do this process a million times. So it's very straightforward. Uh, there are lots of variations on this theme, but they all, in one way or another, involve looking at this kind of a difference. So we can use those distances to build uh, a display, a population network. How similar are our populations uh, to each other? So let's take just one SNP in three populations. So we take our difference in frequencies here, and we connect the two populations uh, at a level corresponding to that difference. And then we can just take that average value, that is the frequency of these two populations, P1 and P2, take its average to represent this node, and then we take the difference between that and this frequency, telling us in this little diagram that population 3 is a little bit more different uh, the, from populations 1 and 2 than they are from each other. And of course, here you can see that just by looking at the allele frequencies themselves. But imagine if you have a million of these SNPs. Uh, the display becomes very useful. 
So that's basically how we go about making these dis displays of population similarity. So here's an example in which we did this for 100 uh, ALU insertion polymorphisms uh, some time ago. Uh, and we have a network showing the similarity of populations in Africa, Asia, Europe, and South India. Uh, and what, what patterns do you notice in a, in a diagram like this? What, sort of, what kinds of things sort of jump out at you? Sorry? Africa. Yeah, well, um, and the African samples here tend to be more similar to each other. Uh, the European samples more similar, the Asian samples more similar. So uh, geographic location does affect genetic similarity, which is not a real surprise. Uh, pop, uh, if people live only a few kilometers apart, they're more likely to mate, especially historically. Uh, than if they live 5,000 kilometers apart. So we see a correlation between genetic location, uh, b between genetic distance and geographic location. Any other patterns uh, that you notice in this diagram? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we see a strong indication of greater variation uh, in the African populations uh, than in really the rest of the world. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Also, we see that the, the ancestral population is closer uh, to the African populations. Again, suggesting that these would be the parental population, uh, the, the source population uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, these are what we call bootstrap support values, they're percentages, and what they tell us is that statistically we can have 100% confidence uh, in this grouping, 97% here, 97% here. So we have basically enough data so that we can be statistically quite confident uh, in these results, in these patterns. Now here we're looking at 250,000 SNPs in uh, a similar collection of populations, just a larger collection of populations. Again, we see uh, African populations here, European populations here. Here's a sample of Iraqi Kurds. These are South Asian populations, Nepal, uh, East Asia, so, uh, the South Pacific, and the New World. So again, uh, the same kind of pattern, where there's a strong correlation between geographic location, uh, and genetic similarity at the population level. Uh, with even more populations, uh, we added in the Human Genetic Diversity Project populations, we again see the same pattern. Now here, uh, this, is, this is a different, pa a different collection of populations uh, with a different SNP panel, as well as a CNV assessment. And again, we see the same general patterns. So there's a reassuring degree of consistency among different studies with different samples using different collections of loci, but all giving us essentially the same patterns. Yes? How does the ancestral genotype determine? Okay, so um, with the, I, I showed you that for the ALU insertion polymorphisms, and there we can unambiguously determine the ancestral state because uh, ALUs are mobile elements that insert into the genome, uh, so the ancestral state is absence of the ALU. Uh, the the uh, what we call derived state would be having the ALU. So we can essentially construct the ancestral population as being one with no insertions. That's one of the advantages of those, of those markers for this kind of analysis. Good question. Okay, so similar patterns. Here we're looking at uh, diversity, and specifically haplotype diversity. By a haplotype, we mean a series of SNPs that are very closely linked together on the same chromosome. So we're uh, looking at the decline of haplotype diversity with geographic distance from Africa. So we have a from actually East Africa. So we have uh, the highest diversity, as you can see, uh, in African populations, 
lower diversity in Central and West Asia, then Europe, then East Asia, then Polynesia, and finally Native American populations. So there is this general pattern that we see over and over again. The further you get from Africa, the less diversity that we see in populations. So African populations clearly having uh, the greatest degree of genetic diversity. And this actually has interesting implications for things like uh, donor matching for transplants. Because of that diversity, there's a greater genetic diversity among donors in those populations, making transplant uh, matching uh, somewhat more challenging. Now, if we look at sequence data, what I've been showing you uh, is SNP data. But we can also look now directly at sequence data. Uh, we're just starting to do this now as it's, as it's becoming more possible uh, to get whole genome sequences from large series of individuals and populations. Uh, and this overcomes some problems that we have with microarray SNPs. Those SNPs generally are selected for high frequency and diversity in European populations because most of the uh, mapping efforts have been undertaken in those populations. In contrast, if we look at complete DNA sequences, we've got an unbiased assessment of genetic diversity in each population. And we get information not just about the common variants that are on SNPs, but about rare variants. So this is a paper that just came out of the uh, Thousand Genomes Project. Uh, what it shows is the uh, essentially estimates of size of African populations. These are the uh, Yoruban sample, European, and uh, East Asian populations. This is time on this axis. Uh, and what this event uh, represents is the out of Africa uh, movement about 50,000 years ago, where a portion of the African population came out, underwent a substantial bo population bottleneck. So this is the effective size, only about 2,000, and then populated the rest of the world with expansion of populations, and also migration between those populations uh, and the African source population. But what's, what's I think, very important about this uh, diagram is that for the first time we're able to estimate quite accurately these dates, these events, the extent of the bottleneck, because we now have unbiased sequence data rather than SNP data. Uh, so we're able to really test models of human population movements and population sizes. And so in general, uh, the model is consistent with the notion that modern humans, anatomically modern humans, people who look just like us, first arose in Africa roughly a couple hundred thousand years ago. They accumulated genetic variation as a result of mutation, drift, and selection. And then something like 50,000 years ago, a small subset of that population went out to colonize the rest of the world. And eventually, something like 20,000 years ago, uh, they got to the New World. Uh, Polynesia just a few thousand years ago, but we can now make these kinds of estimates with some real confidence. And of course, one of the interesting questions is as humans, as anatomically modern humans came out of Africa, they encountered archaic humans, people like Neanderthals. And what happened as those populations met? Well, we now have evidence that there was mixture between modern humans and archaic Neanderthals uh, as they met. Uh, some years ago, it was possible to look at mi mitochondrial DNA sequences uh, from a number of Neanderthal skeletons. That showed no evidence for mixture, for shared polymorphisms, but mitochondrial lineages tend to go extinct very rapidly. Uh, but uh, just a couple of years ago, there was a major paper in science in which Neanderthal skeletons, several of them, were sequenced at low coverage, uh, but providing good evidence that uh, our modern human DNA contains about 1 to 4 percent Neanderthal DNA. Now, it's interesting that only non-Africans share DNA with Neanderthals, suggesting that this event, this mixture event, took place as anatomically modern humans went out of Africa into the rest of the world. Uh, so we see that sharing only in non-African populations. And of course, one of the questions, one of the interesting questions, 
uh, that hopefully we will have answers, answers to at some point, is whether any of those shared sequences, any of those genes, actually had adaptive significance as humans moved into new climates. Did they derive certain adaptive alleles uh, from Neanderthals, alleles that uh, many of us still have today? Uh, so, so I think some very interesting questions about our history that can now be addressed uh, with sequence data. Of course, we may have to throw all of this out. Uh, this is, this is a, a, uh, something I ran across in a supermarket a few years ago, um, and I was, I was surprised, actually, to hear that Adam and Eve skeletons had been stolen. I didn't realize they'd even been found. Uh, but because there were more amazing photos inside, well, I, I decided I, I had to buy it. Um, so I, I, I bought the uh, Weekly World News, and I learned uh, that uh, all that was left was Eve's leg, and that uh, the identity of the perpetrator uh, appears to have been established. So <laughs> some of the things you can learn from, uh, uh, from supermarket tabloids. Well. Uh, this, these, these kinds of discussions, I think, very almost inevitably bring us to the question, well, what, what does genetic variation, what do these patterns tell us uh, about what many people call race? And I, I put that quote in, I put that term in quotes, as you see, because I don't actually use the term race in, in my own writings. I think it tends to uh, generate more heat than light, uh, but it's still, as, as we all know, used in many contexts. And so this is a, um, an opinion uh, piece from the New England Journal about 10 years ago, uh, concluding that race is biologically meaningless. This was a responding piece by Sally Sattel, who's a psychiatrist uh, in the New York Times, who said, I am, and I think this is deliberately controversial, I am a racially profiling doctor. And what she was saying was that she uses uh, self-identified race to help establish dosages of medications and so forth based on empirical experience. This is a statement from the American Anthropological Association uh, back in 1997, who said that genetic data show that any two individuals within a particular population are as different genetically as any two people selected from any two populations in the world. In other words, that there's really no patterning. So with this real diversity of opinions, I think we need some, some data uh, to help address the question. Uh, a few years ago in Scientific American, this cover appeared, Does Race Exist? Uh, and uh, I love this, Science Has the Answer. Uh, we're all scientists, and I think we appreciate how seldom we really have the answer. But I think we have some data uh, that increase our understanding. So one way that we can do this is to simply tabulate DNA se sequence differences among individuals and ask, what do the patterns look like? And I thought it was appropriate uh, to use some familiar faces, especially uh, this time of year. Uh, so let's imagine that we've sequenced uh, Rick Santorum, Mitt Romney, Hillary Clinton, and, of all people, John Edwards. Uh, what we start with is a, a matrix of differences among these individuals. So we just tabulate uh, how many sequence differences do we see, for example, between Santorum and Romney. And we see two. So we put that two in our matrix. We ask how many, do we, how many differences do we see between Santorum and Clinton. We see more. We see six or five. We put that in our matrix and, and so on. So now we have a distance matrix, DNA dissimilarity among these four individuals. And here, with just four people, we can pretty much look at this uh, directly and see the pattern. It looks like this. Uh, this is a hypothetical uh, DNA sequence. But it just turns out uh, that this pair is more similar at the DNA level than this pair. I'm not sure if anyone would want to compare their DNA to John Edwards right now, but uh, uh, we see that uh, in, in our hypothetical example, we have a clear pattern representing the DNA sequence differences between each pair of individuals. Now, you can do this for any kind of data. Uh, and uh, this, this is an example that a pediatric gastroenterologist who works with us and who became interested in population genetics 
uh, came up with a few years ago. Steve Guthrie uh, ran across an article in the New York Times that showed uh, a, a di essentially a distance matrix, that is the number of disagreements on major decisions between each pair of members of the US Supreme Court at that time. And so again, you can, you can see some of the patterns here just by looking at them. For example, Scalia and Thomas almost never disagree, whereas Thomas and Stevens typically do. Uh, but there, there are more data here. It's harder to see the pattern by just looking at the numbers. But you can make one of these networks, we call it a neighbor joining network, from this matrix. And Steve was learning to do population genetics at the time, so he made this network and the patterns become extremely clear. We have the conservative wing of the court here, the less conservative wing here, and uh, Justice Kennedy sort of in the middle. So this is a very convenient way of seeing patterns in what can be very complex data. So now let's apply this to sequence data. This was a 14 uh, KB sequence uh, from the angiotensinogen gene, part of the renin angiotensin pathway. Uh, we tabulated sequence differences, sorry, in uh, Asian, European, and African populations, individuals. And one of the things that you see in a display like this is that for this 14 KB sequence, sometimes an individual from Africa is more similar to people from Asia or Europe than to other Africans. And we see this typically if we look at single genes or single DNA sequences that there is evidence of sharing and mixture. Uh, and in fact, this is a very important feature of human history, that throughout our history, uh, there have been migrations, there's been mixing of populations. So all human populations at the DNA level, when we look at genes, we tend to see evidence of that historical mixture. Uh, I think it's important that there is no such thing as a genetically, quote, pure population, whatever that's supposed to mean. We have a history uh, of mixture. And this is something actually that Charles Darwin was aware of a long time ago. He said, it may be doubted whether any character can be named which is distinctive of a race and is constant. So Darwin, in his observations of phenotypes in populations, was well aware of this. But now let's take those same individuals. So I, each of these tips, by the way, represents one individual. And now we're looking at a couple hundred polymorphisms. And we see that once we look at a large number of polymorphisms, and these are neutral polymorphisms, uh, people do tend to fall into groups that correspond to their continental origin, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Now, the fact that these are very long branches tell us again that most of the variation is found between individuals within Asia, between individuals within Europe, between individuals within Africa, but with a larger number of variants, we get enough information to learn something about the geographic ancestry of these individuals. So the analogy I like to use is, uh, is, is, is when we look at a trait like height in, male, in females and males, and if we look at just one trait, well, of course, there will be a fair amount of overlap uh, between the two samples. You can't determine someone's sex just by looking at their height. But if we add another variable, waist-hip ratio, well, there's less overlap. There's still some, but we have a better uh, discrimination between the two groups. And that's all we're doing here. We're adding more variables, more loci, that give us information about ancestry. Here we're looking at uh, 11,000 SNPs. Uh, this is another neighbor joining network. And you can see that there's, there appear to be groupings here. And if we put labels in, those groupings correspond uh, to a series of specific human populations. Uh, so with that much information, thousands of SNPs, we do get information about ancestry in each of these individuals, corresponding generally to their population of origin. Here are some complete sequence data uh, just published uh, last year. Uh, these are 10 complete human whole genome sequences uh, doing the same kind of exercise. Again, we see European, Asian, and African individuals uh, 
forming groups as we would expect based on their geographic origin. Now this was kind of interesting because these two sequences are actually the same individual, just sequenced on two different platforms. Uh, there were about 500,000 differences in the sequences from that same sample sequenced on Illumina versus an ABI solid. So about the same amount of difference as between these two different individuals sequenced on the same platform. So kind of a cautionary note uh, that we can see uh, a surprising number of differences depending on which sequencing platform we're using. Now here's another way of looking at variation. This is called a principal components analysis. And you see these in uh, genetic, population genetic studies a lot. And basically what we're doing is trying to account for as much variation in individual differences. So each of these dots is an individual. This is a color key of the populations over here. And we're displaying that variation actually here in three dimensions. There's a first dimension, a second one, and then actually vertically a third one. And the point here is that for these 467 individuals, if we're looking at just 10 SNPs, we see no patterns. That's not enough variation to really tell us how similar pairs of individuals are to each other. If we look at 100 SNPs in the same individuals, well, we start to see some suggestion of patterning, but not that much. Now, if we look at 1,000 SNPs, if we have more data, we start to see groupings. And these groupings correspond, rough, essentially, to continental origin. And here we're looking at 250,000 SNPs, and we actually can see in three dimensions, so here's the first dimension, the second dimension, and then the third dimension, that individuals tend to cluster together depending on their population of origin, although there's still a fair amount of overlap, especially for closely related populations. But what it's telling us is that there is information about our ancestry if we have a large collection of SNPs. Yes, sir? Yes. Yeah. So we're just taking 10 random SNPs, and what we're seeing is that with 10 SNPs, that's not enough information, really, to decipher anything about ancestry. I'm uh, just curious that if you were to find 10 SNPs that had a lot of variation in the population, obviously you would find a lot of separation mm -hmm. all these populations. Have you found sort of the magic number of SNPs that can separate well? Yeah, it depends on, uh, so, so these are called ancestry informative markers. And these are SNPs that have extreme differences among populations. And if you look at a million SNPs, you can find hundreds of SNPs that differ widely. Instead of that average 15% frequency difference, you may see 40 to 50% frequency differences. And with a panel of just a couple hundred of those ancestry informative markers, you can get uh, certainly continental discrimination quite easily. Uh, and uh, in some cases with panels of a thousand or so, even within Europe, you can start to discriminate one population from another, at least to some extent. Yeah, so we can take subsets of these uh, that are especially informative about ancestry. And those are the ones actually that uh, some of the uh, uh, companies use uh, to try to estimate ancestry. We'll talk about that. Okay, and uh, by the way, these, uh, we included the uh, HapMap samples in this analysis, and we see that the European, African, and East Asian HapMap samples plot where we would expect them to. Uh, this is a two-dimensional plot of just Eurasian populations, and what you start to see is that really there's sort of, it, this becomes a map of Eurasia. Uh, here's Northern Europe, Southern Europe, East Asia, here's a Nepalese sample, Southeast Asia, uh, and uh, South Asia. Uh, so really a, a map of the world uh, given uh, by uh, these uh, SNP frequency differences now among individuals. But again, we see that there's uh, overlap where certain individuals here from Nepal are more similar to Pakistanis, others more similar to Thai. Uh, so an important point here is that although we get information about ancestry, there's also uh, quite a lot of sharing and overlap among individuals from different populations. So what this tells us is that if we look at multiple polymorphisms, we can learn something about population affiliation uh, in many individuals. Uh, 
we learn about the parts of these circles uh, that don't overlap, that distinguish one population from another. But I think very importantly, uh, this is, a, 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 I think, a real take-home lesson, we can't really go in the other direction. In other words, we can't, based on self-identified population, we can't infer which allele a given individual is going to have. So the inference goes just in one direction because these alleles tend to vary just in frequency uh, from one population to another. So that leads to the question, well, can we classify everybody if we have enough genetic information? Let's go back to that uh, 10K, 11K SNP uh, diagram that I showed you earlier. And what we've done now is to add African-American individuals uh, to the sample. And some uh, plot closest uh, to African samples, others closer to European samples, reflecting the complex history of that population. Here's a network in which Puerto Ricans have been added. Some plot with people from Spain, others with people from Africa. Again, a complex history, and many human populations, as we know, have this kind of complex history where we can't fit individuals neatly uh, into, a given, into a given population box. This is another principal components analysis based on 134,000 SNPs for American populations, African American, European American, Asian American, and Hispanic. Uh, and what this shows you is that for some of the African individuals, each dot is an individual, they're more similar to members of other populations than they are to other Africans. So in this case, self-identified uh, population groupings can sometimes be quite misleading. And that leads us to what I think is a real fallacy, the fallacy of thinking of humans as falling into specific types of typological thinking because there is really so much overlap among populations uh, that rather than discrete groups, what we're looking at uh, is very highly overlapping groups of individuals, especially for any given uh, gene. So this is an interesting example. This is a man named Wayne Joseph. He was uh, a high school principal in California. Uh, he was raised uh, in uh, Louisiana uh, as, as an African American. He became interested in his ancestry, sent a saliva kit off uh, to a direct-to-consumer testing company, and got these results back. That, At least according to their testing, he was 57% European, 39% Native American, and perhaps a little bit East Asian, but no trace of African ancestry. So in his case, his self-identified uh, race would have been, as far as we know, completely incorrect. Now, he chose, of course, to maintain the same cultural identity because that's what really mattered to him. But you can see that if his self-identified race were used in a biomedical setting, uh, it could lead to some mistakes. And I think that really looking at individual ancestry rather than what is called race uh, can be considerably more accurate and valuable. Uh, consider that uh, someone with this ancestry would self-identify almost certainly as African American, but someone with this ancestry might also self-identify as African American, even though genetically their ancestry would be very different. Uh, we now have the tools to assess ancestry in each individual. And I think we should use those rather than self-identified uh, ancestry or population affiliation. So I, I, I got interested in my own ancestry. I sent a saliva kit off to uh, one of the companies uh, just to see what I could learn. Uh, and it was kind of interesting. I'll share the results with you. Uh, one of the things that they type is your Y chromosome. And uh, you learn about your Y chromosome haplogroups. So I happen to have this one. Uh, and it is especially common in Northern Europe, especially Scandinavia. So I think my two grandfathers were correct. After all, they did come from Norway. <laughs> the other thing I learned from this is that this haplogroup uh, is shared not only with, is, I, I share this haplogroup with Jimmy Buffett and Warren Buffett. Um, hasn't done anything for my singing ability or my um, uh, investment uh, prowess, but it's kind of interesting to know that. 
You also learn about your mitochondrial ancestry, your maternal ancestry. Again, I have a haplogroup uh, that is most common in Northwest Europe, so consistent with what little I know about my own ancestry. They also use uh, ancestry informative markers, a genome-wide panel, uh, to infer your autosomal ancestry, what they call ancestry painting. Uh, and I was a little disappointed to see how, how boring my ancestry is here. Uh, it appears to derive entirely from Europe. But again, that's consistent with what I know about my own ancestry. Now here's a little bit more interesting uh, ancestry pattern. This is one that uh, is publicly available. Uh, this is a Berber woman. So the Berbers are a population in North Africa, so they're Africans. Uh, but this woman, as you can see, at least uh, from uh, the uh, ancestry estimation, is 86% European, 12% African, uh, a couple of percent Asian. But she is an African, but with mostly European ancestry. Again, telling us that, uh, these, that uh, uh, continental designations, in some cases, could be misleading. Here's an African-American, uh, self-identified African-American male, uh, and you can see that if we go chromosome by chromosome, mostly uh, his ancestry, 64% is European, 33% African. Uh, again, portraying a complex history of mixture in the ancestry of this person. But he self-identified as African-American. Now, imagine that uh, an important gene that affects a phenotype of interest is located right here, where he has uh, or right here, where he has European ancestry. Well, for that segment, for that gene, his ancestry is European, even though he'd be, he would be self-identified as African-American. Um, and to the extent uh, that the trait influenced by that gene, let's say response to a given drug, to the extent that self-identified race would be used for drug prescription, well, this person right here is European, not African. So I think that the ancestry can tell us important and biomedically significant information about individuals. So what generally do these findings imply? Well, we've seen that large numbers of independent polymorphisms do inform us, at least approximately, about population history, about individual ancestry. But I think it's important to realize that responses to a lot of therapeutic drugs may involve variation in just a few genes. Uh, and those alleles tend to be shared across populations. And we can't predict very effectively which allele you will have based on population affiliation because uh, of the substantial overlap that we see among populations. Uh, here's a good example. This is a paper published on response to ACE inhibitors a few years ago. Very large sample, many thousands of individuals. Uh, and the question was, is there a difference in the decrease in blood pressure in response to ACE inhibitors in African Americans versus European Americans? And there is a small difference, about five millimeters of mercury, uh, in the two groups. So a little bit less response in the, the African American group than in the European American group in terms of systolic blood pressure. But I think the important point here is that there's a tremendous amount of overlap. There would be many, many African American patients that would respond better uh, to an ACE inhibitor than would European American patients. Here's another example. These are um, epidermal growth factor uh, receptor inhibitors used sometimes in the treatment of non-small non cell lung cancer. So drugs like gefitinib, erlotinib, uh, they inhibit uh, tyrosine kinase activity in the EGFR. Uh, and they've been seen to be effective in about 10% of Europeans, about 30% of Asians. So three times more effective in Asian populations than in European populations. Uh, that suggested that perhaps population affiliation could be uh, useful in deciding who gets these drugs. But if you look at the gene itself, if you look at EGFR, there are somatic gain of, somatic gain of function populations seen uh, much more frequently in Asian individuals than Europeans. Uh, and what's been seen is that 70 to 80% of people who have the somatic in, uh, mutations respond to gefitinib, fewer than 10% without the mutations respond. 
So the important point here is that looking directly at the gene of interest, in this case in somatic mutations, sorry, in that, in that gene, uh, that's much more informative than simply looking at population affiliation. Uh, one other example seen here, uh, this is response to, or the, this is the calibrated warfarin dose uh, using the standard clinical algorithm uh, where there are uh, population differences. Uh, but here is the calibrated or the estimated response, uh, warfarin dosage in the three populations if there are no uh, variants predisposing to rapid metabolism uh, in these, these two genes, VCORC1 and CYP2C9. And you can see that much more variation is accounted for by looking at these two genes uh, than by using population variation. Uh, and in fact, uh, most of the population variation goes away uh, when we're looking at directly uh, at uh, those two genes. So uh, again, looking directly at genes gives us, a, I think, a much better prediction of response than using population affiliation. So I think what we can say about genetic variation and race is that uh, we, we see a, a clear pattern in which genetic variation is correlated with geography, it tends to be, but it tends to be t distributed continuously across space. That means it's hard to designate specific boundaries between populations. So race, uh, as conventionally defined, may not be biologically meaningless, but it's biologically very imprecise. Uh, I think that looking at individuals, at their ancestry, is going to give us much more medically useful, actionable information uh, than, the, than a self-identified category. And what I would like to do at this point, the reason I'm showing you this pretty picture, uh, this is uh, from one of my favorite hikes in Utah, uh, so uh, uh, very close to where I live. Uh, I would like because 90 minutes is a long time for us to all sit still. So I'd like you to think about this pretty place and stand up for about a minute, and just stretch, and then we'll uh, do the last 30 minutes of the talk. So uh, stand up, stretch, enjoy yourself, and we'll resume in about one minute. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, were those correlates with exons because you had like stripes? Oh, no. Um, so that, that's 14 KB across the entire genes. So that inc yeah. includes both introns and exons. Yeah. But, but were, were some of the clusters where you had a stripe of a population yeah. and then mm -hmm. a stripe of another mm -hmm. that went away when you uh, looked at another uh, way of looking at it? Uh huh. No, not really, because uh, really you're just looking at uh, information uh, all the way across the gene, both, both introns and exons. There tends to be a little bit more between population variation for, for intronic SNPs than exonic SNPs, uh, probably as a result of selection uh, against variants uh, in the exons, of what we call purifying selection. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Sure. Oh yeah, no, the, what the stripes use are just individuals. So it would be one individual, their sequence uh, variation, how that compares to other individuals. Yeah. Okay, well, with that, with that uh, little refresher, uh, we'll, we'll uh, move on. Now what I want to talk about next, uh, and this is the last part of the talk, uh, is the way that, uh, some of the ways in which our studies of genetic variation, population genetics, uh, have informed our understanding uh, of linkage disequilibrium, which is commonly used in genome-wide association studies. And we'll also talk a little bit about how now uh, whole sequence variation uh, is being used uh, in the identification of disease-causing genes, again, informed by our understanding of population genetics. So uh, let me ask, how many of you are familiar with the concept of linkage disequilibrium? Okay, maybe a third or so. So I think it's probably worth, uh, worth uh, describing what we mean by linkage disequilibrium. We define it 
uh, as the non-random association of alleles at linked loci. Well, what do we mean? Uh, at equilibrium, if we imagine two loci, A and B, with alleles big A and little a, and big B and little b, at equilibrium, we're going to see all of these, we're going to tend to see all of these combinations uh, in a population as we look at copies of chromosomes. And if we imagine the frequencies of these two, of the alleles at these two loci uh, to, be dis to be these, so that the frequency of big A is 60%, the alternative allele, allele little a is 40%, and then big B and little b are 70% and 30%, under linkage equilibrium, the haplotypes that contain these alleles should have frequencies that we just get by multiplying the respective allele frequencies together. So 42% of the time, if we're looking at, say, chromosome 5 uh, in an individual, we expect to see a haplotype that has big A and big B together 42%, because that's the frequency in our population of big A, 60%, times the frequency of big B, 70%. And if they're independent, if these, if these loci are independent of each other, if they're in equilibrium, uh, then we can, we, we can estimate accurately the haplotype frequency simply by multiplying the two allele frequencies together. That's our principle of independence. And similarly, uh, a haplotype containing big A and little b, that's going to be 60% times 30%, or 18%. So we're seeing all of these combinations at the frequencies that would be predicted if the two loci are independent of each other. But what if we see this distribution of haplotype frequencies? We see A and B much more commonly than we would expect based on these frequencies. We see little a and little b much more commonly than we would expect based on these frequencies. And you can see that in the diagram here. When we see big A, we tend to see big B. When we see little a, we tend to see little b. That's linkage disequilibrium. The alleles at these two linked loci are non-randomly associated with each other. So how does this happen? Well, if two, allele, if two loci are very close together, like B and C here, through time, there isn't much opportunity for recombination to break up the combinations. So that B and C, big B and C, are seen together most of the time. Little b and little c are seen together most of the time. But for this pair of loci, A and B, they're further apart. Recombination crossover during meiosis has more opportunities to break up the combination, to put big A in combination with little b. So what that's saying is that over time, many generations for recombination to occur, we're going to see this combination together more often than this combination, A and B. In other words, there's more linkage disequilibrium between these two loci than between those two loci. So that's what we mean by linkage disequilibrium. And it's going to be a result of two things, time and the process of recombination. Now, linkage disequilibrium gives us some advantages in mapping genes because we, first of all, don't necessarily need family data. We can assess linkage disequilibrium in population data. Uh, we can assess it using microarrays, uh, SNPs every 3KB or even denser than that. Uh, so association studies in which we employ linkage disequilibrium uh, effectively incorporate many, many generations of past recombination. And that allows us to narrow a candidate region uh, potentially very effectively. So if we compare uh, the situation with traditional linkage analysis, where usually at best we're going to have three generation families, and we assess recombination directly by looking at affected individuals and families and simply counting recombinants. But the limitation here is that we can really only look at recombination in two or three generations. In contrast, with linkage disequilibrium, we're looking effectively at all the recombinations that have occurred since a disease-causing mutation or variant uh, originally happened in a common ancestor many generations ago. So we're looking at correlations between alleles at linked loci uh, to assess how much recombination there's been, in other words, how far apart these two loci are. 
And so essentially we think of populations as one big complicated pedigree. Uh, for a given variant, ultimately we're going to trace back uh, to a common ancestor some generations ago. This is what's sometimes called the coalescent uh, in population genetics. Now it's kind of interesting, this is just a graph of linkage disequilibrium articles uh, from 1981 through uh, 2008. Uh, and you can see that back in the early 80s, and this is when I first uh, became interested in linkage disequilibrium, uh, there were only about 20 papers a year published on this topic. So you could read a paper every couple of weeks and you knew everything there was to know about linkage disequilibrium. By 2008, that figure had gone to about 1,600 papers per year. So something like, what, 30 papers a week. Uh, and it's maintained uh, steadily that number since then. So this has become a very, very popular topic because of its applications, uh, its many applications uh, in human genetics. Now, the challenges come with the fact that there are a lot of different things that can affect linkage disequilibrium patterns. It is a population genetic process. There are also uh, uh, genomic factors, chromosome lo location, so that uh, close to telomeres where there's more recombination, you tend to see less linkage disequilibrium. You tend to see less linkage disequilibrium outside of genes than within genes. And that's a pattern that's been seen now quite regularly uh, as a result of the, in the uh, HapMap project. There are also DNA sequence patterns, things like GC content, that can influence uh, recombination and therefore disequilibrium. We now know that uh, the human genome is peppered with recombination hotspots. Every 50 to 100,000 bases, we see regions where recombination is elevated tenfold or so relative to the rest of the genome. And we now know about specific sequences, a degenerate 13 MER that's bound by the product of this gene that's associated with at least 40% of hotspot activity. And recombination among individuals varies as a result of variation in this gene. So we're learning some interesting things about uh, the distribution of recombination across the genome. And then there are evolutionary factors that cause linkage disequilibrium to vary among populations. Things like natural selection, selection for specific allelic combinations. Gene flow can generate disequilibrium. Mutation and gene conversion can affect disequilibrium patterns uh, as can genetic drift. So it's a complex process, uh, one that requires really quite a lot of, of uh, study and inference. So things like population age, that is how long ago was a given population founded, that can affect haplotype structure and therefore disequilibrium. So that in a, a population founded a long time ago, say the uh, African populations, well there have been many generations for recombination to occur, we tend to see much smaller blocks of haplotypes because combinations have been broken up over a long period of time. In contrast, in a, a population that was founded more recently, uh, let's take some of the isolated Finnish populations. Well, there have been fewer generations for these recombinations to occur, so we see fewer, we see much larger haplotype blocks. So each of these is a SNP allele, uh, and we tend to see a larger number of SNPs uh, that are associated together because recombination hasn't had as much time to break up the combinations. So that means if a disease-causing mutation occurs here, later on in time, it's going to be found in association with a large number of other SNP alleles in a younger population. But if a disease mutation occurs in the same place in this population long ago, we'll see it in combination with many different SNP alleles uh, because the haplotypes tend to be smaller. They've been more broken up by recombination. So we expect to see quite different patterns of linkage disequilibrium in these different populations. And in fact, if we look at linkage disequilibrium data, here we're going back to the angiotensinogen locus. This is a plot of pairwise linkage disequilibrium. Uh, each of these units up here is a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. Uh, and what we're looking at is the pattern of disequilibrium for all possible pairs of SNPs. The analogy I like to use is this is kind of like a mileage chart. So if this were New York and this were San Francisco, then this would be the distance between them. 
Well, for a given pair of SNPs, for this SNP versus this SNP, this is the linkage disequilibrium between them. And in these plots, red indicates high linkage disequilibrium. Technically, it's a, it's a correlation or R squared value greater than 0.8. So we can see that for SNPs that are close together in a series of Africans, we do find blocks of linkage disequilibrium, but they're relatively small. In contrast, in Eurasian samples, we see much larger chunks in linkage disequilibrium. That's because these are more recently founded populations. As you saw in that early diagram, they underwent a bottleneck, reducing haplotype diversity. Uh, so this is, the, this is really the pattern that we would expect. So a question we can ask is, well, how general are these kinds of patterns? Because up until a few years ago, we were looking at specific regions and specific populations. And what we really want to know is, well, are the kinds of patterns that we've seen uh, really general throughout the genome and throughout the world? And I would say that about 10 years ago, our knowledge of linkage disequilibrium patterns in human populations were kind of like this map of the world in 1544. And you can see that uh, people knew about the some of the major continents at that time, Asia, Africa, some of Europe, South America, North America wasn't even on the map. Well, this was kind of like our understanding of linkage disequilibrium about 10 years ago. We knew about patterns in some populations, in some regions of the genome, but we needed a much more general understanding of linkage disequilibrium patterns throughout the genome. So this was really the basis of the uh, HapMap project. Uh, the original, in the original project, uh, 600,000 SNPs, about one every five KB, were genotyped in 200 individuals from three different populations. Uh, the Ceph Utah, which represented uh, Northwest Europe, 30 trios. Uh, the Yorubans from Nigeria, 30 trios. And then 90 East Asians. So this was by no means a complete sampling of human diversity, uh, but it gave us some idea of diversity uh, in three major uh, populations. And then the idea was to evaluate patterns of linkage disequilibrium and haplotype structure uh, to see how much variation there is in different genomic regions and how much variation is there among different populations if uh, linkage disequilibrium was to be used uh, as a gene mapping tool. And I think the map improved a lot. It looked probably more like this map of the world in the late 1600s, where now you can see uh, the continents, old world continents are pretty well mapped out as are most of the New World uh, continental regions, although for some reason California was missing from this map. But a much better knowledge of uh, general linkage disequilibrium patterns, and that allowed us to understand human genetic uh, haplotype diversity much more uh, effectively. Also, uh, the definition of recombination hotspots the detection of genes that have experienced strong natural selection, and I'll show you an example of that because it helps us to understand uh, gene function. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the detection of disease-causing mutations. So this, I mentioned hotspots earlier, the basic notion here is that there are regions uh, where recombination is elevated at least tenfold in a restricted one to two KB region uh, so that uh, we would expect much, much less linkage disequilibrium for pairs on either side of this hotspot. So this is an illustration here using, again, that linkage disequilibrium uh, chart where we have essentially haplotypes here that are strongly associated. In other words, if you have a G here, you have a C here. If you have an A here, you have a C here. But on the other side of the hotspot, there's really no association. There's no association between these combinations and these combinations. So that represents that recombination hotspot where a lot of crossover is resulting in these combinations showing no association with these. And so when we plot that out, we see strong correlations among these, no correlation between these and those. So uh, how frequent are these hotspots? Well, as we saw, they're located about one, to, uh, one in every 50 to 100 KB. And in fact, about 60% of crossovers in the human genome occur in only 6% of our DNA sequence. 
Uh, so cross these hotspots really contain most of the crossover activity in our genome. And one of the interesting things that came out of a comparison in hotspot location in human and chimp is that even though for a line sequence we're 99% the same as chip, chimps, our recombination hotspots are completely different. So these evolve very rapidly. And in fact, the PRDM9 gene I mentioned earlier that's associated with recombination activity is not active in chimps. Uh, so very, very different patterns of recombination, even in these two quite closely related species. Now another thing that linkage disequilibrium allows us to assess uh, is uh, evidence for positive selection in certain regions of the genome. So the idea is shown here. Uh, if you imagine a mutation occurring, a new mutation, it's going to occur on a haplotype background. So each of these blue stars uh, is a SNP. And initially, of course, that mutation is going to be found in strong linkage disequilibrium with a whole, whole series of SNPs uh, spanning some distance across a chromosome. That is, every time you see this mutation, you're going to see specific SNP alleles. But through time, as that, if that mutation increases in frequency, well, recombinations are going to occur, redistributing the more distantly, relate, uh, the more distantly located SNPs. So the background haplotype associated with this mutation becomes smaller and smaller as the frequency of the mutation increases through drift. But what if there's strong selection for that mutation? What if it has uh, an adaptive advantage? Then it's going to reach high frequency quite quickly, and it's going to maintain disequilibrium with these nearby SNPs, so that we'll see regions of elevated linkage disequilibrium associated with a selectively advantageous allele. And that's evidence for recent positive selection. And as people have scanned the genome, they found a number of such regions. Uh, we won't go through these in detail, but things like G6PD and malaria protection, uh, protection uh, one of the SIP genes, sodium retention, uh, an enhancer element associated with lactase, hereditary lactase persistence, uh, skin pigmentation loci, uh, and uh, this is wor some work that we've been involved in, uh, members of the HIF pathway, the hypoxia-inducible factor pathway, and response to hypoxia in high-altitude populations. Uh, so what people have been looking at then is regions in the genome where there is elevated linkage disequilibrium as a result of natural selection for specific adaptive variants. I'll give you one other example. This is very uh, recent work that we published just a few months ago, uh, and this is evidence for recent positive selection in a region associated with Crohn's disease. Uh, and this disease, uh, as you probably know, is an inflammatory disorder of the intestinal tract. It affects around one in a thousand, maybe a little higher, uh, individuals. Uh, a number of regions uh, have been associated with susceptibility to Crohn's disease, including one called IBD5. And this is a 250,000 uh, base haplotype uh, seen in Europeans uh, and uh, associated with disease susceptibility. Uh, and a number of uh, GM-wide association studies have shown an association between Crohn's disease and SNPs in a specific gene called OCTN1 uh, in the IBD5 region. And in fact, a specific variant, 503F, in OCTN1 is very common uh, in parts of Europe, especially northern Europe, where it attains frequencies greater than 50%. Uh, we estimated that this variant arose about 12,000 years ago, about the time that agriculture uh, came to Europe. It has a high frequency in Europe. You don't see it outside of Europe. And the variant is a gain-of-function mutation that increases the substrate efficiency for a substance called ergothionine by uh, several fold. Here's the evidence for positive selection. I'll just say that these are all highly statistically significant values in different European populations. So we have good evidence that natural selection occurred here. Uh, that's indicated by disequilibrium patterns. But this is what's interesting. Uh, OCTN1 association, and OCTN1, uh, is, by the way, transports ergothionine. Uh, and ergothionine has neuroprotective effects. 
um, as well as antioxidant effects. But there was no clear functional association between OCTN1 itself and Crohn's disease. So what we hypothesized is that because there's a lot of linkage disequilibrium here, there could be a genetic hitchhiking effect where what is selected is this variant in OCTN1. Uh, because of dietary differences as humans developed agriculture in Europe, but it carried along with it variants at IRF1, a gene that's uh, a couple hundred KB away, but that's involved in innate immunity and the clearance of intracellular bacteria, which we know are important in Crohn's disease. So if you look at um, haplotypes that contain both the IRF1 selected variants and or IRF, specific IRF1 variants and the OCTN1 variant, those have a strong association with Crohn's disease. If you look at uh, haplotypes that have only the OCTN1 variant and not the IRF1 variants, there's no association, telling us uh, that the disease association is due to this gene that has hitchhiked in frequency. Alleles have hitchhiked in frequency along with OCTN1, which was uh, selected strongly in these populations. So essentially, susceptibility to Crohn's disease is a side effect uh, in this region of selection for this gene that has nothing to do with Crohn's disease. And we did expression studies showing that IRF1 is expressed much more highly in intestinal tissue from Crohn's disease patients uh, than control tissue and none of the other genes in this region show that difference in expression patterns. So here, we've been able to use linkage disequilibrium uh, to identify a pattern in which selection for one trait, uh, OCTN1, has actually carried along with it alleles that are associated with disease. Uh, and we think that this may, in some cases, be responsible for genetic susceptibility to other common diseases as well. Now, another very important thing that came out uh, of the uh, genome-wide disequilibrium studies is the fact that if you have SNPs that are in disequilibrium with one another, of course, many of them are redundant, and that means you don't have to type all of them. So that if we have this SNP here that is associated in a given individual with these other SNPs uh, and across the population in other individuals, well, that means that all we have to do is type this one, a tag SNP. We don't need to type these others. And you'll hear uh, more about this from Karen Mulkey uh, in her lecture. But the bottom line is that for these genome-wide association studies, we can get complete coverage with a reduced number of SNPs because of this pattern of linkage disequilibrium. But those patterns vary from one population to another. Uh, this is something I'm sure Karen will show you, but this is, uh, I think, one of the successes of those efforts. The many uh, published GWAS now, uh, 1,500 or so as of the middle of last year for hundreds of different traits. And you'll hear more about that from her, but the, the important, the, what I want to get across is that it is our understanding of population genetics uh, which allowed us to uh, apply linkage disequilibrium effectively in these kinds of studies. Uh, so many, many different traits uh, for which significant associations have been established. Now, finally, I want to mention that population genetics is also really helping us to develop new uh, resources, new tools for the analysis of whole genome sequence data. If we look at the Thousand Genomes Project, in which 1,500 people have been sequenced at about 4x coverage, one of the things that this does, it provides control sequences when we're doing variant analysis which many of us are now doing, sequencing patients to try to find rare variants associated with disease. Well, one of the things we need is good control data. If this appears to be a rare disease-associated variant, well, how rare is it? Projects like the 1,000 Genomes give us background frequencies so that we can assess whether a given variant is actually rare or not. And remember that these rare variants uh, vary a lot among populations. That is, they often are specific to certain populations. That's why it's important uh, to do this kind of sequencing, not just in a few populations, but as, as many as we can, because those background variants are going to differ, the rare ones, from one population to another. And we saw that in one of the 1,000 Genomes papers 
Those rare alleles typically are not shared among populations. Uh, population genetic theory also allows us to evaluate when a variant is functionally significant. Um, this is always an issue. If, you're, if you have 10,000 non-synonymous variants in a whole genome sequence, the question is which one of those would actually be contributing functionally to disease? Well, one of the things that we can look at to help assess functionality is evidence of purifying selection in a given region. That is, has natural selection been conscientiously eliminating deleterious variants? That means that that's a region of functional significance. And we've incorporated that in, va in uh, software that we uh, recently developed and published called VAST. And this is a, a tool for analyzing whole genome sequence variation. Uh, we've used it to successfully identify disease-causing genes. Uh, we incorporate population genetics in our estimates. Uh, we look for purifying selection as an indication uh, that a sequence or a variant is functionally significant. And of course, we also look at evolutionary conservation among species. Uh, any region that is highly conserved, very similar across many species, again, more likely to be functionally significant. And of course, this is especially useful when we're looking at non-coding DNA and we can't otherwise ass uh, directly assess function. Uh, so I think that now as we're, we're starting to uh, analyze uh, hundreds and even thousands of whole genome sequences and exome sequences, we're going to see that population genetics, again, will make very significant contributions to our understanding. So finally, uh, this is my, my uh, wrap-up slide. Um, what I've told you uh, this morning is that we can learn I think some very interesting things about population history, our origins, our similarities and differences from our studies of genetic variation. Uh, I think that genetic variation studies uh, give us a much more nuanced view uh, of the topic of race and population affiliation uh, by showing us how similar we all are to one another and how much overlap there is among populations for any given relevant gene. Um, this kind of analysis, as I've shown you, has also been very important in our understanding of linkage disequilibrium, its application in genome-wide association studies. And finally, I think we'll see that population genetics will become even more important uh, as we begin to analyze uh, whole genome sequence and, the, and uh, rare variants, their role in disease. And I hope uh, that I've convinced you that population genetics is even fun, that it's interesting, that it has relevance uh, to uh, many, many different areas uh, of biomedicine. Uh, and uh, with that, I will acknowledge uh, people uh, in, at the University of Utah who contributed to some of the work I showed you, also my colleague at LSU, Mark Batzer, uh, who's uh, done a lot of work with us on mobile elements, and finally, uh, this is my backyard, uh, the lovely Wasatch Mountains, uh, and I really uh, couldn't uh, leave without uh, acknowledging uh, those beautiful mountains. I hope uh, you have a chance to come out and visit sometime, and I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And if there are any quick final questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, sir. So it's a very good question. What about allelic heterogeneity, basically? So if you have multiple mutations um, that are associated with disease that have happened on different haplotype backgrounds, does that make it more difficult? Yeah, or even the same mutation at the same spot. Let's say you have a mutation hotspot. Um, but occurring at different times on different haplotype backgrounds, absolutely, because what you're looking at is those hap is SNPs in the, in the background. Uh, so you could imagine that one SNP allele would occur in association with one mutation event, a different allele with a different mutation event. So that, that's uh, particularly well, both allelic heterogeneity as well as locus heterogeneity uh, make it more difficult uh, to, to uh, 
identify genes using a genome-wide association study. Now, the, the uh, methods I mentioned right at the end, uh, VAST, actually looks at a whole gene and looks at all variants within that gene and essentially sums their effects together so that if you have multiple mutational events in a gene, uh, it will recognize all of them and essentially lump them together. So you, get a, you, you really reduce the allelic heterogeneity problem uh, by doing that. And uh, uh, what we're able to show, and we showed in the uh, paper we published last year, is that it has much higher power to detect uh, susceptibility loci for things like Crohn's disease, because you're essentially summing the effects of all potentially disease-causing mutations within a locus. It was a great question. <laughs>